In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Unlike other creation myths, this story is utterly devoid of description. There is no explanation of how the earth was made, no complex interplay between deities, just a simple exhortation that it was God and God alone. The author wants to emphasize that only one God was responsible. The author then immediately contradicts himself by declaring that the earth is actually without form. One is left to wonder in what sense God made the earth if it lacks shape. The creation of light is still more bizarre. God makes it before the sun and moon, and as such it has no source from which to issue. By light, does he mean photons? Even more bafflingly, after creating light, he then separates it from darkness. Darkness is simply a lack of light, so how the two could exist concurrently is beyond me. And despite what apologists would have us believe, this is not some deep scientific insight. On the contrary, it's reminiscent of ancient incorrect hypotheses regarding the nature of light, such as the Greek concept of light originating in our eyes. In verse 5, God creates night and day, concepts which simply can't exist without a sun. He then goes on to create land from within the earth's oceans, indicating that when God created the earth, he did not form it of rock and metal. This is indicative not of a sphere with a thin layer of water pooled on it, but rather the ancient belief in a single flat ocean with land masses literally floating on it. God divides the earth into the sea, the lowest level, the land, and the waters above the land. God names this highest level heaven, indicating that this water isn't just forming clouds, it's the main constituent of the celestial dome. Unless there's a shell of water around the earth that we haven't discovered, this isn't scientifically accurate. We're also left wondering, if God made heaven here, what did he make in verse 1? God creates plants and, only on the fourth day, finally makes the sun and moon. His intention is for them to divide the night from the day, which had somehow already occurred three times without them. The author also seems to believe that the moon produces its own light. They are two great lights, not a light and a reflector. The stars are made in addition to the sun, meaning the author believed it to be unique, not a star in itself. God's creation of the sun and moon held particular significance in the ancient Middle East, where agrarian societies held the sun to be of supreme importance and the god associated with it was usually considered mightiest of all. The moon, the sun's celestial partner and opposite, was often considered his mate. There's some evidence that the Judites, or even Israelites, held the moon in high esteem, as the numbers 7 and 12 recur throughout the Bible. 7 is the number of days between each phase of the moon, and 12 is the number of lunar cycles that occur in a year. Psalms also says that seasons are measured by the moon. Jews still use a lunisolar calendar, with each month dictated according to the phases of the moon. By stating that God created the sun and moon, the author is impressing upon the reader that these objects have no power except that which was given to them by God. Any deities associated with them are merely stealing from the real God's glory. God begins making animals by forming sea creatures and birds first, and then creating land animals. As birds evolve from land animals, this is quite simply wrong. Finally, he makes humans in his own image and gives them complete authority over absolutely everything he's created. The author couldn't have done a better job stroking his own ego and turning thinking, feeling animals into mere objects. In the beginning of chapter 2, God rests and blesses the seventh day, an ideological myth for the origin of the Sabbath. Such was common in the ancient and medieval worlds for practices whose origins had long been forgotten. However, this particular case seems to be trying to whitewash over the real source of the Sabbath. The Babylonians held rest days, otherwise known as holy days, every seven days beginning at the new moon. They were reserved for making sacrifices to various deities, a ritual the author would certainly have found abhorrent and would have wished to find an alternative focused on his god. This is a strong indication that the Sabbath, along with other Jewish religious practices, originated in Babylon. Even the word Sabbath probably derives from the Babylonian Shapatum. Just a few verses further on, the author retracts his earlier statement and says that there are no men on earth. Indeed, the second chapter repeats the creation story, but with plants made first, then Adam, then the animals, and finally Eve. What's more, whereas in the first chapter God simply spoke and the object appeared, in this version God constructs Adam from clay and breathes life into him. Clearly these are two distinct creation myths but the author or editor was unwilling to part with either. There are several possible origins for a pair of similar stories, but the strongest contender seems to me to be one originating in Judah and one in Israel, which was taken south by Israelite refugees fleeing the Assyrians. As the refugees formed an enormous proportion of Judah's population, the author couldn't simply ignore their beliefs, and because the two versions aren't exceptionally dissimilar, he included both. 
Because the second begins after the earth had already been created, this isn't simply a case of splicing them together. The author knew they were distinct and carefully connected them to create the impression of a seamless narrative. Thus, both groups would feel included. The same interweaving of multiple traditions continues up to the first book of Samuel. Both versions bear remarkable similarities to the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, which is still more evidence that this was written during or after the exile. The intention is to contradict the Babylonian stories and show that Yahweh, not the pagan gods, was responsible for creation. Adam is then placed in the Garden of Eden, although it's never explained how this is particularly different from the outside world. Despite what apologists would have us believe, there's absolutely no textual evidence that death didn't exist. On the contrary, God later expresses concern that Adam and Eve will eat from the tree of life and gain immortality. For that matter, no reason is given for why the trees of life and knowledge of good and evil are placed in the garden if God didn't want humans to eat from them. If he wanted us to live in ignorant bliss, there was no necessity for the option to exist. It isn't a matter of free will either, as God doesn't give Adam the choice of whether he would like to know good and evil. He simply declares the trees off limits. In fact, he doesn't even tell Adam why they're forbidden or what they do. Here we see the first instance of the real lesson of the Old Testament. Do what you're told and don't question it. Completely and blindly submit yourself to God's authority and he'll give you complete comfort. We also get the first glimpse of how the authors of the Old Testament viewed women. Eve is created as an afterthought, a product of Adam, who was made not to be his lover, but to be his assistant. Women were made to be the helpers of men, who owed their existence to men. Very shortly, the same perspective will lead the author to blame all of humanity's suffering on women. While tradition has it that the serpent which tempted Eve was Satan in disguise, there's no textual evidence for this. The devil doesn't even possibly appear until the book of Numbers, and the first unambiguous mention is in the book of Chronicles. On the contrary, the snake is punished for this indiscretion, not Satan, so either the author didn't believe it was the devil in disguise, or God is completely unfair. This is an ideological myth to explain why snakes have no legs, like those found in Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. Until very recently, snakes were considered sinister creatures in most parts of the world, and the author probably saw them not just as symbols of evil, but evil themselves. The irony of this story is that God lies to Adam and Eve when he tells them they'll die if they eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge, and the serpent is punished for telling them the truth. God is far less interested in truth than obedience, and humans can live in paradise if they're willing to be ignorant of reality and completely submit to God's will. Eve eats from the tree of knowledge and gives a piece of the fruit to Adam, although it isn't clear whether he knew what he was eating. Regardless, man is led to break God's law because of women, and suffering in a world supposedly created by a benevolent God can be explained by blaming it on a human. This story closely resembles that of Pandora, and man lives in a world of pain because of woman. In verse 16 of chapter 3, God gives man dominion over woman. As God seeks out Adam and Eve, we see him portrayed in a vastly different manner than in later books. Rather than watching over the earth from a cloud and whispering into the ears of a select few messengers, he physically walks through the garden calling to the humans. He seems to lack the omniscience modern Christians and Jews attribute to him, appearing much more like an ancient Greek or Egyptian god. These deities weren't all-knowing and omnipresent. They were defined by immortality and some control over the natural world. God then casts Adam and Eve from the garden, but it seems that this isn't punishment for eating from the tree of knowledge. Rather, verse 22 implies that God did it to prevent them from eating from the tree of life, and he places cherubims as guards to keep them from getting to the tree, not to keep them from living in the garden. Their actual punishment is the pain of childbirth for women, and toiling in the fields for men. Regardless of God's motivation, this story had a powerful message for the exiled Judahites. They had been given the promised land, and, like Adam and Eve, they had been expelled for disobeying God. Like Adam and Eve, the Judahites needed to accept God's authority absolutely and without question. Despite what he later preaches about forgiveness, God has vindictively punished his humans, and he's only getting started.